Today is a the Rapid Shield Arena, which is a monthly tournament. And I'm currently at my Rapid Peak, so there might be some risk playing this tournament. I hit my peak rating a few days ago, currently 2704.66, number 17 on the chess. So I think I'll try to keep peaking. We'll see how far I can go. I think the plan is to play the rest of the tournament. So there's two hours and 11 minutes and some change left. Uh, this is an eight hour tournament, so it's not easy to play the whole thing. One of these days, maybe I'll, I'll wake up early enough to play the full eight hours, maybe try and claim a shield. Uh, there's a couple of players tied for first, 104 points. Thank you, Evergreen Emperor. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, first opponent playing Dagger 61. Um, I'll maybe mix up the openings today, too. And maybe I'll try and get a different opening every game. We're starting with whatever this is called. I think this is a McDonald attack. It's similar to Grand Prix. But using Grand Prix, white starts with knight c3, so d5 is not possible. I'm pretty sure d5 is like the objectively best response. Now white's playing c4. Interesting. I wonder if maybe I should have brought the bishop out first to allow for e6. I mean, I could play d4 here. I could play e6, but then it's more like a French. I could also take, which looks a little bit strange, but after takes bishop f5 and then e6. Yeah, I don't think I want to play e6 so soon. There's also bishop f5 right away. Takes and then takes, but then knight c3, queen d7. Well, it looks playable. There's some weird distant tactic I'm thinking about. Takes, takes, here, and then if I get to play e6, knight takes e5, I'll have queen h4. But I don't think I want to fixate on that too much. Okay, let's just make a move. Bishop f5. I think this line is fine. Like Even though I'm going to bring out my queen and have it get attacked, I'll put it back on d7. The d5 will be half open. Rook d8 ideas. Eventually, maybe I can complete development. Thank you, legs feed the wolf. Happy three months. So white is leaving the pawn tension. So now I think I'll, I'll be happy to play e6. Oh yeah, maybe some people bringing up the fact I was on the um, the collegiate chess podcast earlier. Shout out to, I forget the exact channel name, Collegiate Chess, I think, on Twitch. It was a live interview with uh, with Joe Brun and Max. Had some fun discussion. Queen A4. So that pins a knight. Kind of like the idea of A6. Because in various lines, maybe b5 will work. Like if I get to take and then bishop takes, and this would be ideal to fork. So if I take, and the queen probably has to take, and I can still play b5. Yeah, let's go for it. If white doesn't take, then b5 will come and I'll have a nice clump of pawns. Oh, Collegiate Chess League on Twitch. Yeah, I was forgetting the final word, league. Congrats on the peak rating. Thank you, Z-Pump. Yeah, trying to keep my peak. I'll play b5. And still kind of a matter of developing the king side. I'm really starting with the queen side development. I mean, <laughs> developed pretty much my whole queen side. 
He's playing this to discourage castling. White very quickly plays queen e3. So now this looks nice. Preparing knight d5 to attack. And not only do I hit the queen, but maybe I would win f4. Although now, okay, um, knight d5 takes, takes. b4 comes to mind, but then there's knight a4. Is that playable, though? It's interesting. b4, knight a4, queen a5. If knight takes c5, I have knight d5, hitting the queen, unleashing the bishop. b4, knight a4, queen a5. If queen takes c5, I win the knight. Knight's defended, b3, my queen's not trapped. So b4, knight a4, queen a5, b3. Then I can play knight d5. Attacking, defending, and probably winning the pawn. I'm going to go for b4. Welcome back, obese Reese. And Floto09. Yeah, this move is sometimes a positional concession. This move I didn't even see coming. But I think I can do the same thing. Like White, of course, is threatening this and this, but with this move, again, I unleash the bishop, I hit the queen. Queen's tied down to defending the knight. If queen d3, I can take and fork everything. Would hit the queen, the bishop, and the g2 pawn. Oh, happy 14 months to new Centurion. Yeah, I think White's in trouble here. These pieces, they, they developed towards the center, but they became tactical targets. My eight-year-old son says he likes your videos. Oh, I like his words. Thank you, Mark Siebert and, and your son. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate that. I take, I, I think I have to take here. I don't want to be bond clouding. And the queen's still attacked. If it takes and rook d8 traps a queen. So that went downhill pretty quickly for white. The queen has walked into the wrong neighborhood. I'm curious to analyze after the game, though. At some point, White probably had a fine position. Okay, now it's cleanup time. I mean, Knight's attacked, so either want to take here or here. If I take on g2, the Knight actually gets trapped, I think. I mean, Bishop h3 could defend, but... Yeah, I'm better off just taking. And I'll take on d4. Okay, life is good. If I play this, there's uh, bishop e3. Play knight c6. Thank you, sipper tea. I do have some tea to sip. A nice green tea today. Okay. Yeah, I guess I should acknowledge if takes takes rookie one, uh, the knight would be pinned, but then there's f6. Okay, here, might as well pawn storm and try and get some mating net with the pawns. Okay, I'll play f6. The queen does defend. If 
Feels like I'm getting close to mate. Play this now. I'm threatening mate in one. I still have casting rights too. Yeah, white prevents the mate. Uh, how fancy do I want to be? I guess I can play this. Just hit the rook. And then this. If I play this, there's bishop takes. And then f4 is not checkmate because here... Oh, but queen d4, bishop takes h4, force the bishop back, and then f4 is checkmate. Oh no, my pawn. Man, I'm also preparing to push my d-pawn. So, nice multi-purpose move. Prepares two different pawn pushes. Yeah, at first I had looked at f4, king h4, and I don't have a knight check because knight's pinned. But with h4 first, I sack the pawn. White has to take with the bishop. And then f4 is checkmate. And the knight actually plays a role. Like Even though this is an absolute pin, the knight still defends a g-pawn. So there are cases where like an absolute pinned, absolutely pinned piece can still defend or take away squares from the opponent's king. It's not like white could take and I take and I and then take and it's a king trade. So nice finish. Uh, if we go back, I think it was pretty clean. Kind of built up on the queen side early. I got the pawn mate, so that's a, that's a Rosen trophy. trying to remember there's some like interesting line how does it go there's a line in this variation so this is called the mcdonald attack um e5 and e takes d5 are the two main moves but there's a really cool line i think starts with knight to f3 white can gambit the pawn and then play knight g5 and the idea is, okay, the most natural move for black is to defend. And then white plays bishop c4, hitting f7. And there's a very cool idea that black is able to play bishop g4 here. It's only played 3% of the time. Oh, but in master's play, it's played more of the time. And bishop g4 is played, white can sacrifice the queen. With bishop takes f7, king d7, and queen takes g4. And there's been games in master level play where white's won. Like if king c7 and takes... Um, yeah, white's down a queen for two minor pieces, but there's compensation. So I saw this years ago. I don't think I've ever played this. Oh, I have. Have I gone into that same line? No, my opponent played e6. Yeah, line only like happens if bishop g4 is played. Yeah, it's not the McDonald's attack. It's spelled slightly differently. You can see here. McDonald. No burgers or french fries involved. So if we go forward here... Okay, bishop f5 is fine. Yeah, white just got into a lot of trouble pretty early on. Oh, but white was okay here. Like knight a4, queen a5, queen b3 best move. Yeah, I was calculating takes and then here it's good for black. Okay. Oh, well, that was the first game. Um, I didn't gain any any rating points, although I probably gained like a fraction, right? So twenty seven oh four sixty six before the game, so I gained point zero six rating points. I'll take it.
New Peak. Let's go. Thank you, Steven. Thanks earlier to Caden Zag, too. Also, Dazzy gifting to Quantum Dumpster. I appreciate the subs and gifted subs. Opponents offline. How much rating am I going to gain from this? Oh, no, my opponent. Okay. Well, now I'm farming 1200s. Let's see. How much rating am I am I gaining? Oh, I gained actually zero points. We need another like decimal place for a thousandth of a digit. Uh, I was excited to at least gain like 0 0.01. Not meant to be. All right, we move on. I'm climbing the standings. I have four tournament points. So sometimes when like I play in the 10 minute pool, players will abort games or any any pool for that matter. But in a tournament, you can't actually abort. The pairings are um, are automatic. And if you try not to move, you just lose. Thank you, George Hermbagger. Subbing for six months in advance. I really appreciate that. Also, Amazing Lines, gifting to Greta Lapi. Appreciate that. Okay, playing Napoleon Bonaparte. I'll play e4. If we see a Sicilian, do I play the McDonald attack? Okay, we don't see a Sicilian. We have an Alakine. I'll play knight c3. And we're going into a Vienna. I mean, I could play like, um. I usually don't do this. This is like a Vienna bishop's opening. I usually play this position from the black side. Bishop c5. Okay, I'll play this. I mean, I'm preserving the chance to play f4. Which maybe I can do right away. And there's also bishop g5 first. I kind of like f4 first, though. The knight of three. Don't forget to sub with prime if you have it. Oh, yes, please. Thank you, amazing lines. I appreciate the reminder. I'm calculating this and then this. It could get a little bit weird. I think that's okay, though. Yeah, I'm going to go for this. Also, thank you, Del Masson, the first time sub. And Woo Boy, subbing with Prime for the first time. I guess the reminder worked for at least one person. Appreciate the Prime sub. Knight c6 is normal, so Black's not putting a piece on g4. And now it's kind of a question how I want to proceed with either attacking or just trying to complete development. I can't legally castle kingside because of this bishop. So the move that actually comes to mind is knight a4. Just aiming to remove the bishop. I think this makes a lot of sense. The bishop can run, but it can't really hide. The bishop d4 or b4, I play c3. Let's say bishop b4, c3, bishop a5, I play b4. And eventually I'll get rid of it. Now, black might end up going for something similar. But I should be okay with that. Yeah, let's take first. We'll start with castling. And if black goes for knight a5, I think I... Do I win a pawn? Maybe I don't win a pawn. Because if takes and then takes, I actually lose a knight. Queen d4 is a, a tactic to be aware of. I 
Yeah, maybe I should have played A3 first. But overall, I'm happy with the setup. I mean, it feels like a, a Grand Prix setup, but it's more of a, a Vienna setup. It's kind of based on what I'm playing against. Oh yeah, after the game, I can share some lines what could have happened if Black went for Knight G4. Here we see Bishop G4. I mean, the obvious move is h3, and then take, and then take, and then let's say here, and then queen f2. There's just a lot of lines where my bishop gets kicked. Like Even in that line, like if black plays this and then b5, I really don't want to be in a spot where I have to move back, black takes, and I can't take with a pawn because of the pin. Take with c pawn, it's kind of ugly structure. So I think I'll go for c3 here. And this gives the bishop uh, some way to escape. Like now if knight a5, I can play this, and then c6, and then this, and then b5, and then bishop c2. So long-term planning here. Really just trying to preserve my bishop and keep the bishop pair for the end game. I could have played like some a pawn move too, but c3 is nice in restricting knight d4. Oh, I see the, the comment earlier from Dalmasson who said, I rarely sub, but your style and oh, I rarely sub like this, but your style and friendly attitude. Okay, that's um, that's nice. I appreciate that. I can definitely do some um, some opening deep dive after the game. Is this opening that we went into? It kind of reminds me of um, what I used to look at in this Lucchini gambit. It's like a reverse Lucchini. Someone said prime subs. Oh yes, it's another person being reminded. Thank you, Gibbo Tickus. Gibbotticus. Gibbotticus. Sorry for probably butchering the name. <laughs> Happy three months, though. Did I get it? Is it Gibbo Tickus or Gibbotticus? It took a lot of effort. Okay, Black wants to trade my. Bishop. Maybe now I can play bishop b5. Like it was nice to align with the king, but now I'm aligning with the queen. And I am threatening to take, take, and take. There's no more queen d4. I'm also threatening to trap the bishop. Yeah, f5 would, uh, or would it trap the bishop? Bishop takes a2. I'd probably eventually trap the bishop. It does it. Because c4, there's bishop b3. Weird tactics. Oh, this could get weird. I don't think black is correct in taking on a2. But I don't immediately see how to punish it. Because when black takes the pawn... The threat is bishop b3 to attack the queen and the rook. I think if black takes right away, I can take on e5. And then, I mean, if black wants to play this, I take and take and the knight's hanging in the end. I mean, generally, I don't really need to give much thought into what happens if black takes especially like an a2 pawn. But there's times where it can still be interesting to calculate. So black takes on f4 first. I'll take back with bishop. 
And this actually changes things because now if bishop takes a2, I no longer have the bishop on c1, so I can play c4, bishop b3 doesn't work because then my rooks are connected. Knight h5, I think bishop h2. If I move back this way, maybe there's knight g3. I mean, it's still a very stable setup. Might be looking to play knight d4 next, attacking all the minor pieces, or pawn d4, threatening the fork. Pawn f5. Wow. Okay, there's a lot of potential tactics here. I mean, for one, I could take, and then whatever takes back, I fork. I'm not 100% sure about the line, like takes, takes, g4, bishop takes, 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 king h1. Should be okay. I mean, I kind of like the idea of this move because I hit the knight, I hit the bishop, I hit the pawn three times. I'm also threatening to take the bishop and after queen takes, I pin the queen to the king. Yeah, I'm going to go for knight d4. It's possible that this was also like very good, but this seems a bit cleaner. And I don't think black's getting really any counterplay in this line. But it's still worth calculating. Like knight f6, if I take, take bishop c4, there is pawn d5. Take, knight takes. It's, it's a nice shish kebab. Like the knight, queen, and king are on a skewer. But the question is, can I eat anything? Queen f3, knight e7. Rookie one. Maybe I can. Okay, it's a forcing line. So takes, takes. Of course, I can also just win the pawn. I still have three attackers. But let's look a little bit deeper here. Takes, takes. Bishop c4, d5 takes. Oh, there's queen e3. I think king here. That looks pretty good. So takes, takes. Bishop c4, d5 takes. Knight takes. Queen f3. There's also rook e8. Oh, but then c7 is hanging. As bishop could come alive. Yeah, I'm going to go for it. I'm holding off winning the pawn because I think I can win more. It's pretty forcing, like black has to do this. And now there is a choice. Okay, let's go for queen f3. So I'm keeping the initiative, every move making a threat. Knights now attacked twice and pinned. And I'm I'm either ready to take here or play rook e1. I think if knight e7, I play rook e1. Because once the queen moves, I can take. And this knight is still pinned. I'm looking for better moves, but this looks pretty clean. And basically, I'm getting uh, two bishops for rook. Uh, might as well take on b7. Actually, two bishops and a pawn for a rook. Welcome back to Rar Leopard. Happy 51 months. Okay, so yeah, that was a big transformation. But going into the end game, the two bishops usually pretty easily overpower the rook. I'm 
offering the queen trade. Oh, I could have taken the pawn too. I guess I can still take the pawn. There is kind of a funny line. If rook... Oh no, rook d8, never mind. Rook d8, I would just take it. <laughs> I was thinking rook d8, rook takes f5. Well, I think here I can probably play rook takes f5. It makes it so... Black can't take the bishop without getting mated. And if takes, 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 it's still mating for white. Hi, Chess Sensei Rosen. Hello, Karst71, welcome back. Oh, a few people were asking earlier why I didn't take c7. Yeah, it's um I was I was so full from consuming um the material earlier. Had to take a small break from eating. King is very safe here. Okay, attacking the rook. No mercy. Okay. I think that was a pretty clean game. It was a nice opening. Got the, the harmonious setup that eventually led to tactics. I think my opponent just left the knight loose and then f5 f5 was played with good intention to try and uh, make progress on the king side but it really just backfired for black in too many too many tactical targets for white to exploit so yeah i think what my opponent could have done was play knight a5 in this position and really just try and get rid of the bishop the same thing i did with knight a4 and Engine's actually saying it's completely fine for black. Knight a5. And my bishop can run, but it can't really hide. Like bishop d5, c6, and... Wait, what? Bishop takes f7? Stockfish being reckless. Oh, Stockfish being clever, actually. Bishop takes f7 with the idea that after rook takes, there's eventually b4. But first, white can take take and then b4 and the knight's trapped so i guess that's why black or that's why white provokes black to play pawn c6 so the knight can't retreat i'm not sure if i would have found that though it's also still hard to judge like what's happening here thank you holy stove the prime sub oh it looks like my opponent's in chat who said I thought knight a5 was bad. Yeah, knight a5 sometimes it looks ugly because you put the knight on the edge and you spend a lot of time moving the knight, but it can still be worth it. Let's see if there's any theory here. So f4, d6, knight f3. Yeah, I was, I was curious about knight g4. It looks scary, like black is preparing knight f2. I was going to play either queen e2 or rook f1 just to make sure I don't get forked. Um, yeah, and basically what's happening is if black goes in with the knight or bishop, I'll simply just move to defend, like bishop f2, king d1. And, okay, I lose casting rights, but black's pieces aren't great. h3 is a threat. And if knight f2, rook f1, the knight would have to move back and then I can keep expanding. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, so some lessons to take away from this game. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, after f5, this is kind of the point of no return for black. Welcome back, Leo Spaceman. Happy 23. So we'll keep it going. I'm at a new peak. 
I think, right? I mean, I've, I started the stream at 27.04, but I've been gaining fractions of, of a rating point, at least with that last game. Not the game before it, though. Oh, and thanks for the game. Yeah, Ferdinand von Zeppelin, who I believe was Napoleon, Bar Napoleon Bonaparte. It was by a few different names. Yeah, sometimes it takes a little bit longer than, than usual to get games, at least with rapid tournaments. I'm trying to work my way up the standings so I can play higher rated players. Playing Evgeny Ignatinko. Um, so we've had a McDonald attack and like a Alakine turned Vienna. What to play now? Let's play a modern. G6. I don't usually play the modern. I'll go for. I mean, the, the basic setup, bishop g7, d6. Bishop e3. I mean, I don't really know too much theory here. The c5 kind of looks attractive. Because b2 is not defended. I'll play c5. And this might transpose into some kind of dragon. Okay, bishop b5 check. Could take with queen or knight. I think there's arguments for both moves. Maybe I'll take with knight. Keep the option open of queen b6. Wow, pawn e5. So white's building the pawn chain against my bishop but there's pawn tension with both of the center pawns i mean it feels like i can win a pawn here with simply taking hitting the bishop whatever white takes back with i should win the e-pawn i think e5 was maybe a bit overextending there And not to mention, I do have queen a5 if I want it, but I don't think I want it. Hi, Eric. Can you tell us a story of a low point in your chess career and the lessons you took away from it? That's a good question. I have to think about it. I'm trying to think of like my worst tournament ever. I did have like a really bad result. It was a high school national championship. What year was it? It was 2010. I was probably around 23, 2400 at the time, at least uh, US rating, maybe 2200. I forget exactly. But I remember that I struggled like so much. There were so many games where I was like losing and drawing to 1800s. I finished the tournament with four and a half. Was it four and a half? Maybe, maybe it was four out of seven. Hey, thank you, Cantana Chess. If you're just joining, I'm playing chess. I'm also telling a story about, uh, a difficult tournament I had in the past. Hey, what to do here? E4? I have to somehow defend the pawn. I could play rook d8 maybe. Yeah, rook d8 is kind of nice. What was I saying? Oh yeah, so this tournament in 2010 I had a bad score. I lost like probably 30, 40, maybe 50 rating points from it. Um, and it was, it was frustrating because before the tournament, I worked like a lot to study and prepare. I think coming into the tournament, I was like fifth seed within the top 10 seeds. And like, I think I finished around hundredth place or something. 
But then the lesson I took away from it was like in order to play at my best ability, I need to be like in really good like physical and mental form and be really involved with the games. Like during the games, I was just like not so well involved mentally. I had this mindset that because I'm just higher rated than my opponents, I should beat them easily. And that was not the case. Like I really have to work to play at my rating level. So the next year, I actually took the tournament like much less seriously. Um, next year was 2011. I was a, a junior in high school. And I just kind of went into the tournament to have fun, but still like, okay, work hard in every game. And then, then I had like one of the best tournaments of my chess career. Um, I went seven out of seven and and won the the high school nationals. So it's probably one of like the the worst tournaments followed by one of the best tournaments of my life. It was the same same tournament too. Okay, so White gave a piece. This is going well. Well, um, yeah, save the knight, unleash the rook, block the check. I still haven't castled, but castling is on tap. Yeah, I've realized that, like, when it comes to tournament performance, there's so many factors that can come into play. And one of the biggest factors is, like, your mental, your mental form in the given moment. And there's a lot of like non chess factors that support it between diet, sleep, exercise, but then also like discipline during the game to stay focused, like think on your opponent's time. And when I had like, when I had the good result in high school, but also like good results in general, it's usually when my mind is like clear and ready to work and I'm not distracted. And similar, like when I play on stream too, there's times where I just blunder like so many things because I, I'm off form, right? <laughs> I get distracted too much, but so far today, I think I've, I've been attentive to what's going on in the positions. Uh, there's a lot of questions. Let me speed run the questions in chat. Opening suggestions for black and it's e4 1200. Uh, there's a lot of openings. King's Pawn, Karo Khan, Scandi, um, French. I think French is underrated at that, at that level. But I mean, pick a mainstream opening and it's it's hard to go wrong. I am drinking tea. Yeah, this is, um, I think it's TWG tea. It comes from somewhere in Asia. It might be from Singapore, actually. That's nice, uh, nice tea brand. Question if I'll play in Granke. I'm not playing Granke. Gr Granke? Granke? Gren? I think that's the tournament in Germany that um, has a lot of strong players. But yeah, I'm not really playing any classical events through at least the next month or two. Have you ever drank Yorkshire tea? I have, yeah. Actually, I had a very good experience with Yorkshire tea. I visited uh, Jovanka Hauska in Norway, and she had like a lot of Yorkshire tea in her tea stash and had it with like, um, I think it was like milk and a little bit of sugar with a tea biscuit. It was pretty good. Okay. There's a lot of moves here. There's queen takes e5, there's knight d3, there's h6. Uh, let's just not overthink it. I'll take a pawn. f7 is defended. 
Maybe I'll try and target F2 soon. Uh, I was going to say, if, if I had the chance to play Rook D2, that would be too soon because Knight E4. It's tempting to take and then play this move. Does that work? That might actually work. I mean, I win two rooks for a queen. I also have this move, though. Oh, this just wins uh, a bit more cleanly. Yeah, I was like beginning to calculate takes, 92 and takes, and then let's see if I can back rank mates. But with this, if rook takes and I'm mating, if king moves, I win this rook. Hey, Bobbin is from Yorkshire. Nice. I've never visited, but I mean, I've been to the UK a few times, been to London. I do apologize. There's a lot of questions. I'm having a hard time uh, answering everything in chat. I want to go for a smother mate here. And the king's going to run. Knight e2. Oh, I could play queen e2. Oh no, my queen and then checkmate. The problem with queen e2 is I get mated. So let's not get mated. Sometimes the first, the first step to winning a chess is to not lose. There's a question. How often do I teach at the St. Louis Chess Club? Uh, several years ago, I did their like residency position. Like every few weeks, there is a new, usually grandmaster, sometimes international master, that will teach their weekly lectures. So I did it a few times in 2017, 2018. But I have not taught a lecture there in the last like, at least three or four years. But I did do an event recently, played Blitz with uh, all challengers. We filmed the games. Um, I, I haven't received the footage, but maybe it'll turn into eventual content for YouTube. Okay, I'm going for some smother type thing. Not quite smother mate. But we win the queen. Now it wins a pawn. Yeah, white's not dying so easily here. We still have to figure out. Okay, never mind. I was going to say I still have to figure out how to checkmate, but. Position was not looking good for white. Oh, there's a comment uh, mentioning Harney and Sons, which is a nice tea company. Yeah, there's a viewer who sent me a really nice tea blend by them. It was like, it's called Hot Cinnamon Green Tea. It's really, really good. Naturally sweet. Been drinking it uh, a lot. So I think this was a pretty smooth game. My opponent really just kind of went wrong with e5. Uh, probably should have played c3. At least c3 I think is one of the more natural moves to effectively undermine the bishop on g7. And life would go on, like knight here, knight d2. And it's playable for both sides. The question, why are you not berserking more? I'm not really trying to win the tournament. I mean, I joined about six hours late. And with rapid chess, I like time to try and explain my thoughts. 
and also try and answer questions from chat. Also, thank you, Harkir, gifting 10. I appreciate that. Hope you're doing well. I'm still catching up with questions from earlier. The question, if I drink coffee, which I do, um, I have a, what is it called? Keurig? Keurig? No, Nespresso. Nespresso coffee machine. It takes the pods. But I, I don't drink as much coffee as I do tea. Okay, playing TTRV. We've played twice before. I'll keep mixing up the openings. Let's play an English opening. I don't play the English too often online. But, I mean, for a long time it was my main weapon over the board. So I do have a whole repertoire around English. Although with G6, yeah, we might be going into more of a King's Indian. Um, yeah, I'll play E4. I don't play this position too often. There's a few different setups I've played. I used to play the Averbach, which is Bishop E2, Bishop G5. I'll go for H3. It's a more flexible move. I mean, there's a lot of playable moves for white to develop in different ways. Bishop d7. Okay, this is a very peculiar move. It's usually the knight comes to d7 or black castles. I'm actually wondering if I can strike with e5 right away. Like usually e5 is not great because, I mean, as we saw in the previous game I played, it's overextending. Like black can usually take, take, and then trade queens, but bishop d7 deprives black of that option. And I've also prevented knight g4 with h3. If knight h5, the knight could get trapped. If knight g8, I think uh, I think it's justified to ex expand here. Yeah, the knight's going to have to go back. And then I can reinforce with knight f3 and bishop f4. And black's going to be pretty slow to castle kingside. So it's pleasant. I mean, not at all winning, but uh, nice to grab the early space. Got the center. I do have the choice here whether to take with the knight or the pawn. If I take with the knight, it would maybe enable like queen f3. I mean, the drawback of taking with knight is it allows the knight to just come back to f6. Taking with pawn prevents knight f6. So yeah, let's take with pawn. Still trying to hamper black's development. If black wants to develop the knight, yeah, e6 and knight e7 looks natural. But now I can play bishop g5. And if knight e7, I play knight e4, then f6 is in my full control. If black plays pawn f6, I think I'm happy to just trade. So queen c8. Okay. I mean, this move is tempting. It seems like black wants to play this next move, chase away my bishop, and then develop the knight. So, I'm looking for ways to generate threats, which isn't so simple. Like, knight e4, h6, bishop f6 takes... It might be good, but it's kind of hard to judge. I 
I could play queen d2. Queen d3. I'm taking time here. I'd, I'd really like to try and play accurately. I think I'll just play queen d2. It's somewhat of a multi-purpose move. Prepares either rook d1 or castling. Also makes it so, like, if h6 and bishop f4, I have the battery. Then black can't easily castle without losing the pawn. I'm going to go for castling. Or actually, wait a minute. I have to defend the pawn first. I was about to just blunder the pawn there. Maybe queen e3. I guess that was another purpose with queen d2. Improve the queen. And then... Yeah, black is trying to get the knight here. So I like the idea of g4. Very prophylactic move. Preventing... Knight f5. And black is so restricted here. Like, it's hard to play actively. There's h5. Then probably either play rook g1 or bishop g2. But going forward, I mean, I'd like to get in knight e4 with the square. There's also bishop f6. And of course, casting and using the d file. Oh, there was a question earlier. Does the Shield Arena show the current tournament rankings? Who won last month? I think it does. Yeah, it shows uh, the defender from last month. I'm not sure if you can easily find the, um, the last month tournament link. You could probably Google it, though. Like, if you, if you Google... Rapid Shield Arena, and then the month. You can probably find it. Ooh, Black Castles. So now I have these squares to work with. Um, I feel like a kid in the candy store. There's so much candy to choose can only have one piece of candy at a time. A knight e4 looks pretty sweet. Because if I lose a pawn, then takes, takes, and then check. And if takes, takes, there's no way black surviving that. It's so hard to stop knight f6. Yeah, it's about to get sweeter. Thank you, Critical Twit. Happy three months. Okay, Vlog does have one kind of nasty idea. Is knight c2. So I don't think I can actually go for this right away. Because takes, takes, and then actually, oh no, my queen. So, I think I can just castle. Yeah, there's there's no need to really worry about knight takes a2, even though it does come with check after king b1. Knight f6 is still going to be pretty deadly. It's actually nice to uh, like fork the bishop and king. So king h8, I win the bishop. If takes, takes, and it's a party on the dark squares for white. And my queen is invited. Thank you, Sternaski. I probably mispronounced that. 
I mean, CZT is probably probably requires a unique way of pronouncing, but I appreciate the first time prime. Yeah, I imagine like it's made in made in four or five. And black can like prolong prolong things with knight takes a two, maybe knight c three check, a few spike checks, like queen d eight and take, but. Yeah, the engine would probably say, like, mate within six moves. Pre-move BC3. Okay. Hey, I gained a rating point. New peak, 2705. To be more precise, 2705.5. Yeah, I think my opponent just got into trouble, like, out of the opening, bishop d7. Sometimes, like, this move is played if white goes for the fiend Kato, and then there's idea queen c8 and bishop h3. But it doesn't quite make sense against this move, especially with e5. So yeah, generally, if you play the King's Indian, you get to this position, and casting is probably most natural, stay flexible. And then very often black will decide between going for c5 or the eventual e5 a bit later. I was going to play bishop to g5. Oh, this is called the Makoganov attack. I didn't know this had a name. One idea with this move is that if black plays h6, white plays this. It looks like white loses time, but white gains time with queen d2 later to provoke king h7. There's um, yeah, a good number of master's games here. I miss king d2 for a quicker mate. <laughs> I, I did see king d2 and then some discovery. So king b1 was actually the quickest mate, mate in three. And then, ah, so this, uh, it was mate in six starting in this position with bishop takes f6. Yeah, I think all the king moves are force mates. So hard to go wrong is white. Dark Lord is saying, wow, I'm 482. Do you know any good books I can read? Um, at that rating, I'd probably recommend uh, the, the New York Times bestseller, How to Win at Chess by Levy Rosman, a.k.a. Gotham Chess. I'm pretty sure it's a New York Times bestseller. He sold a lot of copies. But it's a very good book for, I think, really anyone below the... 800 rating level. I also have a books recommendation page on my website. There is a, a category for kids and beginners. Thank you, old Walter, with the, the books command. There's a question, how do you set Lee Chess to show these lines and colors on the right? Ah, yeah, this is, um, I mean, this is basically the game review feature. And someone ran it automatically. It could have been my opponent or an observer, but usually after you play a game, can I show? Let me just show with another random game. And most people have like used computer analysis on my games. So I don't know if I can actually find one that hasn't been analyzed. Okay, let's say this game. So with this game, when you finish the game, you click analysis board. And then if you're on this tab, you'll see this button, request computer analysis. And this is a equivalent to chess.com's game review feature, where it'll analyze with the engine, it'll say how many blunders you made, mistakes and accuracies. 
it'll give you the accuracy score and then you can see all the colorful colors on the the right all the blunders that were made so it's a nice feature it's completely free too you don't need a premium account really just doesn't even have premium accounts and then you have stockfish too if you want more more specific analysis there's also the openings database a lot of the features in one interface Thanks for the stream, perfect antidote to the long, gloomy day in STL. Oh, thank you, Scully Lives. Yeah, it is kind of gloomy outside. Not sure if it's rained yet. But, um, yeah, hopefully the weather improves. Anyway, I hope this answers the question. Um, yeah, with the Masters database, you can see like the the top players who who've played the position on the Thanks board. For the game, in Rosen, thank you. Oh, thank you, Trevlar. I was mentioning Trevlar earlier. I was interviewed on the Collegiate Chess League podcast, and we were talking about Rosen trophies. I I did give a shout out. Hope you're doing well. Happy seventeen months. There's another feature, I don't use this too often, but there's this button, learn from your mistakes. And basically, once you've ran the computer analysis, you can click it, and then it'll basically give you training exercises based on the game. Queen A8 was a mistake, find a better move. What's a better move? Queen C7? Evaluating my move. No, there's a better move. Queen D7? No. I remember analyzing this other day. Queen... I don't know though. What kind of database do you use for serious tournament preparation? I can give a few answers to that. Bear with me one moment, though, because uh, <laughs> I'm struggling. What's the best move here? B5? B5 loses this pawn, though. Let's try B5. Like, how does black not lose a pawn? Yeah, how is this equal? I'm... So I... Do I have, like, 97... I'm actually really baffled here. Maybe d5. d4? No. Bishop c8, bishop b6. Okay, I'm going to view the solution. Queen c8. And what happens after it takes? Wow! Bishop takes h3. I was not looking on the king side. And this allows black to not be worse because takes, takes, knight h2, and knight g4 forces a draw. Wow. Anyway, that's how you use this feature. Um, sometimes even if you don't like actually find what you could have done better, you can still still try and learn what the computer suggests. It's a very engine-like idea, though. <laughs> so let me try and answer the question from ATC Faust, asking the database I use for serious tournament preparation. Um, honestly, it's usually just a live database in Chessbase, which I could show. Yeah, maybe I'll take a small break from playing just to leak all my prep. Chess base. And there's two main things that I'll use between chess base and then there's another website too. I turned off the the display share because I don't actually want to leak all my files. But um here we go. 
So this is chess based and it does have some features that you can't use in Lee chess. And it's more tailored for like very serious tournament players who are usually like 2000 plus, but um, let's just play an opening here. When you're using chess base and you're connected to the internet, there's this feature called live database. I just press enter as a hotkey to toggle it. I usually like it on this side. And this will show, this will show the games that have reached the current board position. It's a bit more up to date than Lee Chess. You also have access to all the games like immediately. And then you can sort by rating too. So if I want to see like the highest rated players who have ever played Ponziani, uh, usually in over the board games, you can see, uh, yeah, Magnus played it once against Hare Krishna. And then this will allow me to kind of see opening trends at top level. Magnus won this game. And Chessbase is a software I use to build out my more serious opening preparation. Um, but for most players, like Lee Chess Study is probably the, the easier software to use. Thank you, Chartman CZ. Appreciate that. So then there's another website, like when I'm preparing for a specific opponent, there's this website called Chess ABC. And they have a pretty up to date database. Like, let's say I want to prepare for Levy Rosman. Then I search his last name, I find him. I click, let's say I'm playing the black, or let's say I'm playing the, the white pieces. So I'm preparing against Levy, who's black. Then I can very quickly see his opening, uh, his opening repertoire. Like he's played C6, obviously he's a Carol Khan player. And some of these games are his title Tuesday games. So I think he's more recently been playing Scandi. So sometimes I'll, like when I'm preparing for someone, I'll use this website along with chess base and I'll, I'll do like a double screen with, um, with both windows open and then basically look at the repertoire and then analyze with, with the main database and with stockfish to try and figure out how to best destroy them in the opening. So I hope that makes sense. Hopefully this is valuable for some people. And this is probably more applicable to players like 1800 plus, but it can be useful in terms of like chess study too. If you just want to find like top level games in a certain opening or see what a certain player plays. Okay. Shall we move on? Oh, the website. Yeah. I guess if you want to, I can share the link. It's just chessabc.com. This is the link for anyone who wants to prepare against Levy. Uh, see his black repertoire. Okay, so back to tournament. I have a new rating peak. I'm 600th place. Next opponent playing churn side. Okay, I'm going to close out a chess base, so... Yeah, that way it doesn't eat up any CPU. Okay, what to play? Let's play something new. Let's play uh, Knight C3. Maybe I'll go for Joe Bava London. Actually, in this case, we're going to transpose into probably a Pierce. And I'll still go for this line, Bishop F4, which could come from Joe Bava London move order. Idea is to castle queenside as quickly as possible. Now pawn e5. So speaking of opening prep, um, I'm still in opening prep. This is, I think, the top engine move, pawn e5. I think this is the third game in a row that we're seeing pawn e5 from white very early on. 
because the last game I got to play it as white, and the game before that I played it as or played against it as black, where it wasn't good for white. Okay, with C six I, I think I'm out of my specific prep, but I remember ideas like of course ideas to attack. G four doesn't quite trap the knight because there's takes takes and knight g7 but it looks pretty good yeah i'm gonna go for g4 because after it takes takes knight g7 i have either knight f3 to prepare knight g5 or i have h4 h5 to try and open the h file Okay, so we get this position. Now, you have to choose like which, which path to go down. It's possible that both moves are very strong. If I play knight f3, there is this move f6. And then I can't easily play knight g5. Although maybe like knight f3, f6, knight e4. If I play this, I mean, this looks really strong too, because like h5 is so hard to stop. So I think I'm basically spoiled for choice here. So I'm calculating like this, let's say takes, might as well take back, queen a5, h5. Yeah, like once the h file opens, I'll be threatening mate. I'll play h4. I guess I should also note if, if black takes, I probably play bishop d3. I'll keep pushing here. Okay, so black takes. Now, it feels very close to force mate. I mean, it's definitely not force mate here, but like if pawn takes pawn, I have bishop c4. Before taking on h7. Like there's a line takes bishop c4, e6, and then I take on e6, because if knight e6, it's mate. Wow, so black doesn't take back, but rather moves a knight to defend h7. Now I can play g5. I could take first too. Hmm. Choices, choices. I like g5. I'm really just trying to remove the knight to win h7. Yeah, we see knight f5. So this hits the queen. I and mean, there are funny lines where I sack the queen, I win two knights. I get pawns pretty deep in box territory. But I think I'm better off just playing some queen h2. So I'm still attacking the knight and still trying to eventually take on h7 with the queen. And Black's been trying to fight with the last few moves. But I'm not seeing like a clear option for Black here to like save everything. Yeah, that's maybe the best try. So now I'll take. And Black takes the pawn, I'll take on h7. I mean, not to mention that I'm attacking e5, bishop c4 is still on tap. So it's looking really, really good. Okay, h6. So now what to do? And if I play bishop c4, there's e6, and I take, or I could take first. And 
then bishop c4. Um, yeah, both moves look fine. I think I'll play bishop c4 first. There is a line of king h8. I, I sack the queen for mate. It takes and then mates. The pawn and bishop would take away the squares. Okay, here I'll take on e5. Bishop b3 was maybe more natural, but with bishop d3, I want to take and then take and then mate. I don't think black is quick enough to really get any counterplay. b4, I take and then take. Okay, let's just get rid of the knight. Play queen g3. And if king h7, I can sack the rook. I think I can still sack the rook. If takes, it's made in two. Oh no, my rook. Yeah, it's probably force made at this point. Rook h7 coming. I mean, it's uh, it's an opening that really just crumbled very quickly from black. And black didn't really make any like clearly obvious mistake. It was more a falling victim to like pretty, pretty quick opening attack. And especially with this opening, there's a, there's a need for black to play precisely to come out alive. I see there was a question earlier from um, Chartman CZ, which I can try and address. I'm playing this to set up some mate. Uh, the question was basically asking why on some days you play at a 1400 level and other days you play at your actual 800 level. And I was actually touching on this earlier. Um, but this is very common like for a lot of chess players. Like On good days, you can play a few hundred points above your level. On bad days, you can play a few hundred points below your level. And very often, chess performance not only comes down to understanding and experience, but also comes down to like your 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 mental alertness during the game and how focused you are. So generally, when you play chess, you want to, you kind of want to be self-aware and aim to play when you're, when you're basically in your peak mental and physical shape. So I know a lot of players maybe play when they're distracted or low on sleep or uh, just to pass the time. But if you're a bit more conscious with when you play and how like you're feeling when you play and if you can minimize distractions that can really help uh maximize your your playing ability so um yeah what to analyze here we can go back oh aaron pilgrim saying let's analyze g takes h7 I considered it. If I take here king h8, it's a situation where black is using the h pawn as a shield for the queen rook battery. It's probably still really good for white, but I wanted to make sure the h file would stay open. Thank you, Fro Dizzy, the first time prime. Oh, did I miss? Oh, 
in this position, I had G takes H7. Good point. Do, Because F8 is hanging. I guess I didn't make the connection that after knight F5, the rook would be in danger. Oh, so probably, yeah, a few people in chat caught that. And then, like, not even am I mating, but I'm mating in a really beautiful way. I can take and promote to a rook, and it's two rooks taking down the king. Let me do that again without pressing the star key. You don't see this every day. Ah, I miss the chance. Could also take with queen too. Could also take and promote to bishop or knight. But then the knight could block. Anyway, um, yeah, I think knight bd7 is already like a clear mistake, even though it's usually one of the most natural moves for black. Um, oh, even castling is... I mean, castling is probably the most one of the most played moves on me chess is like yeah over half the time players castle uh for players that play king's indian or pierce if you encounter this line i would recommend not castling i think c6 also the engine thinks c6 is the best move like just preparing b5 and leave the king in the center where it's actually a bit safer Because, yeah, after e5, and I mean, basically what happened in the game, it's a lot of fun for white. Okay, let's keep it going. 462, so top 500. Yeah, I've played, I've played six games so far. I've gained about one rating point. Okay, next opponent playing Chesperado. I've never played before. I'll play. Oh, I said I would mix up the opening every game. So what to play? I'll play Sicilian. I played Sicilian in the first game, but I don't think we're going to see the same opening. Yeah, this time we see an Alapin. I usually like to go for this line with queen takes d5. Like one drawback in the Alapin is the knight can't come here to attack the queen. And e6 is a more solid line. I used to play bishop g4 when I was younger. But I like to sometimes save the bishop or save the possibility of fiend cadoing. Still opening prep. Knight a3 is pretty trendy. The idea is to play knight b5 and try and triple fork. It also supports bishop c4. And bishop c4 I don't think is as common. Drop back to d8. Because now knight b5 doesn't really threaten anything and I can kick it away. White's leaving the tension. I think maybe now it's time to take. Because I didn't want to play bishop b7, and then white takes, and I have to move the bishop again. <clears throat> and it's looking likely white's going to be left with the isolated pawn, which is usually characteristic of the alapin. I don't think I want to take the knight. Even though it does double white's pawns, it gives away the bishop pair. So we'll go for just solid bishop e7. And get ready to castle. I think the ideal setup is castling, b6, bishop b7. 
Maybe eventually knight b4 to d5. Rook c8. And pieces will have like decently solid squares. So knight b5. I guess the knight wants to come back to a more normal square. Like maybe white should have left the knight on b1. It's possible white's preparing this move though, so I do have to be careful. Hmm. Like if I castle and then bishop f4, but then I play a6, knight c7, and rook a7 should be fine. Yeah, I'm in the castle here. White does play bishop f4. Yeah, so what I don't want, like if I just play some random move, like h6, then white could potentially force repetition. But with a6, I create the square for the rook on a7. Yeah, white doesn't dare go in with a knight. Knight c3 is probably the best. And now I might as well expand, like pawn, pawn b5. I'm realizing if bishop b3, bishop b7, there might be pawn d5. And I'd rather white not be able to trade off the pawn. So I might play knight b4 first. Yeah, because bishop e7, d5, really not have the center liquidate. Go for knight b4. That's a very typical maneuver in these Alapin positions. And the knight's a bit happier on d5 compared to c6. And it's a general principle, like when you're playing against isolated pawn, meaning there's no pawns on the neighboring files for white. It's good to have a knight directly in front of the pawn. A knight is one of the best blockaders. The drawback with this move, I'm losing a little bit of time. White might be able to stir something up on the queen side. Although a4, maybe I play this and hit the bishop. Okay, now I'll play bishop b7. So what used to be like a really bad passive piece, at least back when I played e6, it's now one of my best pieces. Happy diagonal, happy bishop. I'll play knight d5. Yeah, white's like solid though. I think it just requires more gradual improving. I think rook c8 makes sense. Maybe there's some argument of taking and then trying to target the c pawn. But I'll start with this and see what white does. Don't mind trading. Oh, thanks earlier to Axe or Typo explaining how subscriptions work. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to, uh, yeah, explain everything to everyone. Yeah, again, if you have Amazon Prime, you can subscribe for free. We have the Prime command. It does give you ad-free viewing, gives you emotes, gives you a sub badge, helps support the content. So we do trade nights. There's another general principle when you're playing against the isolated queen's pawn. Trades of minor pieces are usually preferable. 
Like the more minor pieces that come off the board, the weaker the pawn can become. I'll play bishop f6 here. And there's scenarios where if we trade off all the minor pieces, then the plan for black is to triple up on the d file. But it's still very far away from that. Knight e5 is a good move. I have to be careful. Like queen b6 looks natural, but walks into knight e7. So maybe queen e7. Just preparing rook f d8. Queen g4. Now yeah, white's trying to build up some pressure on the king side. Go for a rook f d8. It's possible I'll go for g6. I just give the bishop a square to drop back to. But I think things are pretty solid for now. White can't play bishop c2, which is sometimes a nice option for white. I'm controlling c2. Like maybe I can play a5. h4 is interesting. Hmm. All right, let's go for a5. I feel like I've optimized my non-pawn pieces. Now I'm trying to optimize my pawns. If I got to play a4, I think that would force a trade on d5. Then I'll get the bishop on d5. Okay, so white's preparing bishop c2. That makes sense. Queen b4 comes to mind. There are some kind of funny lines around queen b4. Yeah, let's start with queen b4. Uh, I have to have some danger levels, though. Yeah, I actually really have to be careful. Queen b4, knight f7, queen d2. I think it's okay, though. But it's a common sacrifice with uh, f7 and e6, maybe a bit loose. Okay, I'm hitting the rook. And the calculation I did very briefly was this, this. I have queen e6. I guess king f8. Or maybe even I can take, take and take. I lose my queen, but get two rooks and knights for queen and two pawns. So, or maybe even queen and three pawns. I lose a5 in the end. It'd be an interesting material imbalance. And the ball is in white's court. So rook d1. So I no longer have to worry about this. And the funny line I was thinking about was this. And if takes, I take, hit the rook and the pawn. There's no rook c7. I think I'll go for this. It's a weird idea. I'm threatening, um, I'm threatening queen takes d2. This is kind of stemmed from trying to prevent white from playing bishop c2 and creating some distraction. So my queen has invaded. If rook b1, then a4. d4 can be a target now too like maybe i can play this unleashing the bishop and the rook oh there's also this idea unleashing the bishop hitting the queen and if pawn takes there's mate and knight e3 could be really sweet and it is a move here 
I just go for it? Knight e3. It prevents queen d1. I think I just go for it, because I think I'm winning g2. This is an unexpected tactic. The queen has so few squares. I mean, queen h3, I take on g2, basically mating if white tries to save the queen. If queen f4, queen e1, king h2, is it mating? Maybe then queen f1. Not giving a check, but rather threatening the mate. Yeah, it's kind of pretty. Like queen f4, queen e1, king h2, queen f1. Because with the knight and bishop hitting g2, okay, it's not happening. Oh, interesting move. So white is counterattacking my queen. I want to give a check, but all the squares are covered by the knight, bishop, and rook. And white's obstructing the bishop. If I take the pawn, I lose the knight. Yeah, good move. I could maybe go for takes, takes, queen e1, king h2, knight f1, king h3, knight d2, or knight takes g3 there. If I, t I mean, I can also go for taking. Take a moment here. Weird position. I feel like there should be some easier put away, but maybe not. Take, take. A4. Yeah, it's not the move I want to play, but I think it's worth it. Okay, now I play this. So this and then this. Uh, a4. A4, I mean, knight d2. Take on g3. Maybe I can take on g3. There's h5 as well. Queen b1. I'm going to take on g3 and keep it simple. Maybe it has something better there. King takes. I play queen, queen h1, threatening queen takes h4 checkmate. Imagine this was coming. Rook swings over. I take on d4. And there's queen eight, and then I block. I lose a five. I mean, the king's on g3. There's rook d3 looming. I feel like it should be good. G6 doesn't quite work. 
Maybe h6 is the safest? Bishop. I also have queen b1, which is kind of an interesting idea. Allows king h2, though. Actually, yeah, let me play queen b1. Because this way... I'm threatening rook d3, but I'm also threatening to trap the bishop with a4. Because I've taken away the c2 square. If rook takes b5, I'm trying to calculate rook d3, rook b8, bishop d8. Rook takes... Okay, we don't have to worry about that. So now I play a4. Yeah, somehow the bishop has been trapped on b3. If I get the chance, I'll make Luft. Um, h5. If rook b8, I have bishop e5. Oops, I hung a pawn. <laughs> Okay, let's uh let's just not flag. Oh, white does have two pawns for the, the thing. Go for rook d1. How to make progress just takes. Okay, that was a close one. Interesting game, like a wild tactical battle. Oh man. Uh, I think I was in control like most of the game. I got a decent opening. I mean, I got pretty much everything I wanted from the opening. Like happy development. White lost time moving the knight. And then in a lot of like kind of gradual improving moves. But things got very spicy around here. Another month went by. Hey, happy 43 months, Adfost. Hope you're doing well. So engine says this is just equal. Good afternoon, Eric. Happy 30 to me. Good afternoon, young dairy. Happy 30. Hey, I found the the only winning move according to Sockfish. Yeah, it's nice to spot this idea a bit earlier. But knight f3 was a good resource. I took, okay, so it's still winning. Queen e1, knight f1. But I couldn't quite figure out what to do here. I mean, knight g3 is still best, so I played, like, all the top engine moves. Ah, I could have just taken on d4. Ah, that supports this move, and then, then the queen can come back if the king tries to go to h-file. Yeah, that's actually a simple move to overlook. Like a free pawn. I was more focused on the king. I was threatening mate, but white defended. I still could have taken on d4, which I did. So actually, yeah, I kind of kept the advantage. I mean, it was, it was pretty much always better for black. I just wasn't entirely confident with this decision. I spent a long time trying to figure out knight d2, but the problem with knight d2 is queen d1. Okay. So I guess White's, White's main mistake this game was allowing knight e3. Like the best move here is rook c2, saving the rook and the pawn. 
But this looks scary because queen e1 and a4. Oh, but it's not so bad because bishop takes d5 and white's alive. Maybe white gets some counterplay. Okay. Well, I reached a new peak. 27.06, right? Refresh. Oh, this list hasn't updated. Refresh this page. 26, 2706.56. I usually say you should not be too fixated on rating, but it's fun to look at the stats, like, especially at an all time high. So. I'm tired. I think I'm going to follow the advice that I was kind of talking about earlier, that sometimes if you feel like you're tired or maybe missing things, take a break from playing chess and come back when you're fresh and fully focused. So yeah, I think I'm going to wrap things up. It was a fun stream. Uh, big thanks to everyone who tuned in.